Good afternoon. My name is Kenneth Knespel. I'm a professor and chair of the School of Literature, Communication, and Culture at Georgia Tech. And it's my pleasure this afternoon to welcome you to the inaugural lecture in a series of lectures devoted to the future of the museum. Our meeting here this afternoon celebrates multiple institutions and recognizes how cross-institutional museums will be in the future. Of course, our meeting at the High Museum this afternoon celebrates the remarkable accomplishments of the High and in particular recognizes the success of the High's affiliation with the Louvre Museum in Paris. Here, allow me to recognize the accomplishments of Michael Shapiro, the director of the High, David Brenneman, who I'm happy is with us this afternoon, the curator of the Louvre Atlanta Project, and our colleagues Patricia Rodewald and Virginia Shearer. In the coming weeks, we will have the opportunity to hear artists and critics from London and Paris speak about their very real visions of the future of the museum. The British artist Jane Prophet will speak on April 4th, and the French scholar, critic, and landscape artist Yves Abliou will speak on April 18th. Our meeting this afternoon also celebrates the growing collaboration between the High Museum and Georgia Tech. During the past year, Georgia Tech, together with the High Museum, has explored plans to showcase the potential for academic artistic and administrative interaction, particularly directed toward the Museum of the Future. During the three-year Louvre exhibitions, we look forward to contributing speakers, satellite exhibits, technical and scholarly expertise, and educational opportunities that combine art and technology in the name of innovation and integration. For their support of this project, I want to recognize Georgia Tech's president, Wayne Clough, and the provost, Gary Schuster, and our dean, Sue Rosser. Of course, our meeting this afternoon also celebrates and welcomes ASEX and all its friends, both to the lecture this afternoon and to the national conference that has already started. ASEX has long been a friend of Atlanta and the High Museum and Georgia Tech. Considering that our meeting this afternoon marks the inauguration of lectures devoted to the future of the museum, I'm very pleased to recognize that our speaker this afternoon is a friend to all our institutions. Her commitment to being with us today manifests itself not only in conversations over the past months and years with many of us, but in the ordeal of being stuck at O'Hare yesterday for 12 hours, and Barbara arrived only at 2 a.m. this morning. Barbara, we're very happy you're with us. Yeah. Barbara Stafford is the William B. Ogden Distinguished Service Professor at the University of Chicago's Department of Art History. She is the author of many books, including Body Criticism, Imaging the Unseen in Enlightenment Art and Medicine, Artful Science, Enlightenment Entertainment and the Eclipse of Visual Education, and Visual Analogy, Consciousness as the Art of Connecting. Stafford's recent essays focus on how developments in brain sciences are informing our assumptions about perception, emotion, sensation, and mental imagery. Her new book on cognition and, visual, and visualization, entitled Echo Objects, the Cognitive Work of Images, is being published by the University of Chicago in May. And it is this book that provides the foundation for her presentation this afternoon. The title of the talk is Neuroscience and the Art Museum, What's Left? of selective attention. Barbara, it's with great pleasure that we welcome you to Atlanta. Oh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Ken, and uh, thank you everyone for being here. I, I know I wasn't the only one who had airplane difficulties, and I'm so happy to be in Atlanta, to be back at the high, to see the lovely Rienzo Piano edition, uh, which I had not seen, and most of all, to be at my most famous meeting, uh, my most favorite, excuse me, meeting uh, in all the world, ASEC. So I thank you all, uh, and I thank all the uh, lovely faces I know and recognize in the audience. Uh, my topic is precisely this. We're looking at Kazuyo Sejima holding up her project for New York's Museum of Contemporary Art. Uh, my topic is what has happened to attention, uh, or uh, what in the 18th century might have been called the long conscious look. Um, and I'm going to explore this with you, um, uh, particularly in light of new research uh, in uh, the cognitive science, both positive, and I have both positive and negative comments to, uh, to make about that, um, and to suggest it has profound implications for our institutions, uh, institutions like museums, as it does for those of us interested in all types of visual pedagogy. Um, I, I show you as well. Uh, this is also Kazuyu Sejima, um, uh, a kind of architecture, uh, a space for that most difficult commodity in the contemporary world, a space for contemplation, for prolonged contemplation, um, one uh, where interior and exterior uh, is um, uh, posed uh, as, uh, as a point of scrutiny, something uh, that I just saw a moment ago with the Rienzo piano, uh, with that lovely array of busts um, uh, highlighted um, and calling uh, to be examined in their particularity. Uh, the problem is, why is this so rarely done? Uh, I'm going to propose um, uh, a, um, my master topic um, today is going to be uh, that uh, one of the things that is undercutting and that we need to take cognizance of that is undercutting um, willed seeing, if you will, uh, is the enormous ubiquity of a language of self-assembly, self-organization, um, and um, uh, um, uh, 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 a, uh, of autopoiesis. Self-assembly, of course, it's not at all a contemporary, uh, excuse me, it's not at all a contemporary, could we forward it? I hope I haven't done something wrong. Could we just uh, forward the uh, PowerPoint for me? Yes, thank you very much. Um, Self-assembly, as I don't have to tell uh, this audience of these weekendists, is hardly uh, a contemporary uh, uh, topic. Uh, the spontaneous organization of matter into coherent arrangements is a compositional uh, principle governing uh, diverse materials. Uh, the great French um, crystallographer, the Abbé Heu, uh, is responsible uh, for pointing that out already in the late 18th century. Uh, there is also, of course, uh, that most witty of 18th century uh, natural phenomena, uh, the freshwater polyp uh, studied by Abraham Prem uh, Trembley um, and uh, meditated upon it uh, at length uh, by uh, Charles Bonnet, uh, this creature um, that uh, when one lopped off its limbs uh, managed uh, to self-assemble it, um, uh, self-assemble its parts again um, in the most amazing uh, and ingenious manner. Um, however, the arena of self-organizing substances has vastly expanded since the 18th century. Uh, there is a whole um, group now, very interesting group, of um, earth artists, echo artists, bio artists. Uh, I'm showing you here uh, the work of uh, the um, uh, Scot Scottish artist Andy Goldsworthy um, uh, that actually is entirely predicated on foregrounding in the most most delicate and subtle fashion, uh, the self-organizational principles uh, inherent in the natural world. Um, in, in, for example, here in this uh, uh, hole and leaves installation, and here in this very beautiful uh, uh, Goldsworthy of um, the patterning of ice crystals, again, uh, from uh, the, the work on crystallography. But there are many, many other areas uh, in which this phenomenon of um, seeing self-assembly and self-organization as the fundamental driver uh, in the natural world um, is also apparent. Uh, one can think of the underlying granular dynamics of physical systems in general, study 
studied by uh, contemporary chemistry, uh, the internal compartments uh, of a living cell. Uh, Georgia Tech uh, is uh, quite active, um, uh, bio, uh, both biochemistry and uh, 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 various branches of biology looking at that. Um, two, in a more frightening uh, fashion, again, making an, an Atlanta illusion uh, because this is such a medical city, um, to the uh, waves of pinwheeling electrical activity occurring in ventricular fibrillations of the heart. That, too, uh, is predicated on self-organizing uh, motions. Um, Today, however, these natural atoms and natural molecules have been infinitely um, expanded uh, in a downward direction as well. I show you, um, this is uh, by the famous MIT microphotographer by Felice Frankel, um, who specializes along with the Harvard uh, chemist George Whitesides in exploring the nano world. Uh, these are nano crystals. Um, and again, uh, what is interesting about this vanishing infinity of the nano world, we're used, of course, to Pascal's two infinities, but there is now this downward infinity. Um, what is interesting about this nano-designed world, uh, that these genetically altered organic structures not only offer novel features, in other words, they really do bring something new into the universe, but again, from the purpose of my talk, what makes them interesting is that they impart a precise level of control over their selective interactions. Again, uh, they are, as it were, autopoetic structures. And uh, so that uh, this massive, my, my point with this introduction, is that this massive, wide-ranging interest in self-organizing systems, both natural and artificial, uh, extending to synth synthetic biology as well, uh, especially its creation of building blocks that include programmable instructions for self-assembly, uh, I find this massive attention in research um, telling because it comes at a time when the computational neurosciences view the brain as largely an autopoetic system running on predetermined instructions. Now, if I have any neuroscientists in the audience, I'm well aware of neural Darwinism. I will come back to that a little bit later on. But I want to talk about, in foreground, a preponderance of research uh, that is focused precisely on these spontaneous, intrinsic, automatic structures um, that are are what we would call pre, um, uh, that pre-exist uh, attention, that pre-exist the attentive faculties and actually don't require it. This is both our opportunity, our challenge, and I want to suggest our problem. Um, in my talk, I'm going to grapple with three intertwined issues emerging from the revolutionary findings of the modern neurobiological sciences that have, I believe, fundamental implication for all of us um, interested, and I mean here uh, both museum curators who have to attract and keep at a high level the attention of a very um, mobile and fickle public, um, and those of us who stand in the classroom on a daily basis. The f uh, it's, so it seems to me that this is what I have selected to put out for, for us to consider. Significantly, these three issues are also reversals of powerful earlier epistemological models, many of them, by the way, shaped and refined in our beloved 18th century. They are first that, uh, the fact that cognition uh, is now irredutably shown as not functioning like seeing. Um, I don't have to tell this audience what a venerable analogy that has been, going back to Plato and, of course, uh, reified, um, especially at the beginning of the 18th century in Locke, um, but more generally in, um, uh, the British, by the British empiricists. Um, in a way, I'm going to suggest to you that this is a downplaying of vision uh, at precisely um, at the moment when there is paradoxically an enormous amount of attention paid uh, to the microstructures of the retina um, and to the various visual, to the visual cortex in particular. So it's an irony and a paradox at the same uh, time. And it is, um, uh, it is a downplaying that occurs in the various um, uh, in the very different neurological camps that exist out there, the computationist symbolic, the connectionist dynamic, and the embodied inactive. I don't care which one you look at, this, um, uh, this occurs. 
The second issue is related to my first. One of the chief ways uh, in which neurobiologists and cognitive scientists are managing to bridge the disciplinary gulf between the sciences and the humanities, and actually these guys are asking rather humanistic questions. We would be rather stunned, I think, um, to see uh, the ways in which, the, the rather subtle ways and, and, and problems that they are drawing our attention to. Um, um, the, uh, the issue um, is their exploration of the ways in which human um, perception, the subtleties, the refinements, the complexities of human um, perception transcend the observable. Now, uh, we could say, well, this is, of course, no surprise to humanists. It was certainly no surprise to um, somebody like Alexander Cousins with his famous blot um, method of blotting. Um, and I'm going to translate uh, this associational work of Cousins into contemporary language by saying that what it draws on is a preselective inferencing, inferential, uh, or extensional impulse, uh, which is now um, uh, located quite specifically in various brain regions from the insula to the nucleus accumbens. One can be actually quite specific uh, where uh, these impulses lie to select what the brain detects in accordance with its own, here I come back to it again, its own self-organizing structure. Our thoughts, therefore, we have been shown in large measure are not focused outward uh, because, as Patricia, uh, as Patricia Churchland puts it, the brain-mind continuum is largely an autopoetic self-organizing system. Even higher level consciousness is born aloft, I quote, on an ocean of automatic life regulators. The recent estimate is 90%, much like digestion or the secretion of bile. To be sure, the activity of the cognitive system has to be understood as shaped by the co-evolving environment. And here, neural Darwinism is extremely important. Uh, the work of Gerald Edelman, I would herald that as something that, that is a force that works against um, uh, the research practice that I began with. Nonetheless, the brain as a set of self-sustaining and self-reflexive functions performs largely unconsciously and autonomously even when it adapts to changing surroundings. Moreover, um, as we know from uh, recent brain lateralization studies, it is not just our global functional states that are skewed in the inbound um, direction. And here again, I want to cite the work of contemporary artists who it seems to me have understood this intuitively uh, and for a long time. And I want to uh, herald actually the work of someone like the Franco-American artist Louise Bourgeois, uh, and her, uh, especially her cells, her uh, cell installations um, that play on uh, this inner directedness, this um, ways in which um, we uh, have, um, I, I want to say, uh, even a gut level response to, um, uh, to certain forms. Language-related processes um, have long been lateralized in the left hemisphere, and the more holistic spatial and perceptual functions have been assigned to the right hemisphere. Yet this neat division of labor has been shown, especially through labor on brain lesions, to be something of a cognitive illusion. Both left and right hemispheres work together to create a single individual, with one side often filling in for damaged functions belonging to its mirror opposite with the aid of the corpus callosum, the large bundle of fibers by which they communicate and cooperate. The brain mind, therefore, is not a blank slate. In other words, it is precisely not Lockean. Um, it isn't there waiting for impressions like a wax tablet. Even before we begin to reason, it is weighted with a diverse repertoire of somatic images carrying with them a load of effective valences, precisely uh, those valences that somebody like Bourgeois um, um, uh, taps into that color any occasioning impinging object. This fascination with a mostly world-independent language of thought, 
as it is often referred to, um, characterizes a spate of recent fields. Um, I want to cite cognitive anthropology, neuroeconomics, neuroethology, um, and also neuroaesthetics, and I'm going to dwell on that a little bit later on. However, again, as this audience perfectly realizes, Vico, much earlier on, uh, in uh, the early 18th century, the famous Neapolitan uh, jurist and polymath, realized that this, what today is thought to be a kind of universal mentalese that rides underneath um, our uh, more selective uh, systems, um, that this universal mentalese also fabricates an imaginative space of enlightenment in which to conceive of alternative realities. From deep within this cognizing material cavern, at least since the upper Paleolithic, humans have projected shadowy mobile shapes um, on the evocative, and uh, I'm sorry, have projected shadowy mobile shapes on the evocative environment that in turn assumes the shape of the human mind. Uh, I'm thinking of Vico's Verum Factum, uh, but at the end I'm going to come back to this point and say there is an enormous difference between Vico's interest in the origins of public communication and a kind of solipsism uh, that it seems to me has uh, enveloped us. I will return to that as a point at the end. What is my burning question then for all of us? That is for those of us who are preoccupied with the changing role of the visual arts and most specifically with the changing role of the visual arts within these institutions that are changing as we speak. Let me put the question another way. How do we instruct the remaining non-autopoetic 10% of the self still actively fashioned by and open to sensory input and environmental context? Since so many basic systems are encoded invisibly and unconsciously in the body and face permanently inward, what makes us direct our attention outward at all patiently opening our eyes to the manifold appearances unfurling before them. This brings me to my third issue, and I want to put it positively. The compression of this focusing role of vision, that is, um, the vision as a conscious focused activity, reduced now to this very small portion of the spectrum. One could say that that's simply negative, but I want to propose that it has a positive component uh, because perceptual acts are now directed not to some new object, but to the same delimited thingly environment whose myriad appearances are apprehended dynamically through kinesthetic and tactile sensations. In other words, this downplaying of vision has placed vision within the ambit, the larger ambit of the work of the five senses. And one of the most exciting um, bits of news about recent work um, uh, on the brain is the absolute inextricability of um, motion and vision. That is, and something, of course, uh, and we can think of um, many art movements um, that have intuitively understood, I'm bringing in the Italian futurists, I'm trying to be global in my, um, uh, uh, in my talk, uh, the work of the, uh, that, that have understood that kinesis is absolutely, this is Giacomo Balla, uh, uh, is absolutely central to aesthetic um, experience. This primacy of movement to scene. Uh, I bring in as well uh, the work of Bridget Riley. It's very interesting. Uh, I was in Zurich this summer and saw the wonderful expanded eye exhibition um, at the Zurich Kunsthaus uh, where, um, and looking at this work of the 60s from this new neurological research, it's extremely interesting because one can see actually um, that it was almost made in a laboratory. That is how experimental it is and how it required the white wall of the museum Museum in order to have um, uh, its um, uh, optical effect. However, you notice that its optical effect is one that we have absolutely no control over. And this, again, 
um, is a point I will come back to. I also brought in uh, another, uh, Bridget Riley, I brought in the work of the Paris-based uh, Russian artist Victor Vazarelli, um, also extremely important, who adds um, a psychedelic dimension uh, to, this is his uh, uh, rather whimsical um, uh, um, uh, design for a power station, a nuclear power reactor. Uh, but also predicated, you notice, on enlisting mechanisms, retinal mechanisms over which you have no control. And uh, that is, that's the point I want to make for the moment. Um, so in light, um, uh, in light of the ability of motor experience to performatively and phenomenologically dissolve the gap between subject and object, it's a way of bypassing our rational higher cortical functions and grabbing us, as it were, at a deep physiological level. Um, the, uh, in light of the complexity of these um, phenomena, should we perhaps be thinking of a situationist studies rather than of a visual or media studies dominated by the continuous strip models of film, video, and other projection technologies? In other words, do we need another model uh, for that, um, uh, which those of us interested in the visual are, are doing? This dynamic focus would take into account the fact uh, that motor, the motor sensory organs of an eye must be simultaneously integrated with one another, as well as with a multiplicity of perceptual appearances that are also in flux over time. And it would also, by the way, be a wonderful way that we could connect our work in the 18th century, uh, uh, the work of uh, people in the 60s with contemporary installation uh, work, particularly installation work with a phenomenological bent uh, way beyond Merleau-Ponty. This is the um, insta wonderful um, uh, contemporary um, uh, Danish artist, Olafur, actually Icelandic, Olafur Eliasson, um, who works um, with those very substances that Chardin worked with, namely mists, vapors, steam, smoke, um, to create um, a uh, environment, a situation, rather uh, that embeds vision in the other uh, sensory organs. And uh, uh, I, uh, that then, as I said, is a, a, a positive thing that we might, um, uh, might think more about. Um, moving beyond the 1990s research focus on uh, CT, uh, PET and fMRI localizing brain imaging technologies, the neurosciences of the 21st century also pursue um, something much more elusive. In other words, the decade of the brain, many of us were working on our body books um, uh, at the time of the decade of the brain, and uh, things have really moved into um, uh, a very different, uh, have moved into a very different era, area. Um, an area where what becomes important is not the ego or the I, but rather a kind of decentralized brain in the body, what Simerzeki calls the micro-consciousness. In other words, not a single consciousness, but a kind of distributed consciousness uh, that exists in uh, the various sensory organs, and also a de-anthropomorphized uh, codependence uh, of these uh, various uh, almost autonomous systems in their reaction to the environment. And I bring in again uh, the work of Andy Goldsworthy, which it seems to me is interesting to think about in this light. Um, his uh, Wind and Leaves uh, piece here, a piece that is really completely de-anthropomorphized, enormously sensual, uh, but de-anthropomorphized. Um, or, for example, his Smoke piece. This is my most 18th century of, of, of Goldsworthy, too. I mean, a much more delicate um, and subtle and sophisticated, uh, less heroic concept of earthworks than Robert Smithson, and, and one can think of many of the, uh, 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 the figures from uh, the 1960s, the first uh, heroic earth art, uh, earth moving generation. Um, so um, anyway, uh, I, I just put that out. I, I want now um, to talk, however, because the word neuroaesthetics has been bandied around uh, so much, I want to um, speak both about the positive um, and, let me say, the problematic uh, aspects of some of this research, keeping in mind what my overarching theme is, this vanishing and, uh, and uh, in this vanishing phenomenon of selective attention, and perhaps subtle 
things that are undoing it uh, that uh, we perhaps were not aware of and perhaps how one might rectify that. I want to look at um, the brain, I want to briefly look at the brain modularity work of um, the two people whose names are associated with neuroaesthetics, Semerzeki and Vyas Ramachandran, um, who uh, I'm going to propose to you um, foreground a certain it's interesting that they choose what works of art they choose um, to make their brain modularity arguments. They make autonomous a certain kind of art object, um, which is not to say that what they do is wrong. Absolutely not. It's actually quite illuminating to understand it, but it is not enough and it is not the whole picture. That is why we need the neurosciences, but that is why the neurosciences need us. Zeki, it's, this is the kind of work that interests Zeki. Um, work, um, not surprisingly, of a certain French cast. René Magritte, I'm showing you René Magritte here. Also the Platonic Cubists, the Puto group, Les and Metzanger. Um, are particularly high um, in their work. Um, and they are, why are they invoked? Why are they studied? Uh, because they illuminate certain facts. They are absolutely indubitable about the discreteness of motion perception. That is that uh, the notion that we perceive things as a continuum, uh, that is an illusory construct. In point of fact, although it occurs at an almost nano level, um, we perceive things discreetly, something that, of course, Magritte realized quite well. Um, also, they are fascinated by work like this because of contour reading in and because of the bi-stability of images, of certain kinds of images. Um, what Zeki means by the brain's, I'm quoting him, quest for essentials is this involuntary, involuntary uh, ability that we have before anything reasoned kicks in of extracting invariant features from a sequence. Um, it also has another look as well. And uh, Zeki explores how the simple constants in our heterogeneous field of vision with respect to color, shape, and organization are picked up especially but not exclusively by area V1 of the visual cortex and its adjacent areas, V4 for color and V5 for motion. And these are actually all quite close together but separate. Um, he is constructing a bottom-up modular model of vision by looking at how the brain cells are excited by very selective object properties without our conscious control, without our conscious control. These automatic processes constrain humans to pick out and attend to the constancies present in their field of vision. For example, face recognition, um, the fact that we have more than 500, for example, neurons dedicated uh, to, dedic uh, to picking out areas in the face. And I think one can think of everybody from Reynolds to Romney uh, to Greuze um, in terms of uh, sensibilité and the nuances of 18th century portraiture, which perhaps might benefit uh, from knowing that and applying that and thinking about that um, as a phenomenon. Um, I want to turn now to his colleague, I'm very, oh, sorry, I uh, wanted to bring in the impossibility just to show you um, um, these, the, the surrealists, of course, also very interested in playing these games um, where it is impossible, um, uh, where one sees one thing and therefore cannot see another, this whole issue of a switching and bistable percept, which is something that very much um, I brought this in for, I know there are many people in ASICs uh, fa fascinated by questions in physiognomy, and I want to bring in, um, the. it seems to me the entire um, uh, history of caricature might be thought of in a different way. Um, and it is particularly the work of V.S. Ramachandran, the other person who contributes to this neuroaesthetic um, uh, phenomenon, um, who, uh, who um, develops this. Um, Ramachandran, um, is interested um, in anatomizing the multiple ways in which the limbic system reinforces certain perceptual and cognitive constants of reality. Like Zeki, his focus is Janus-faced, intent on discovering 
correlations between human pattern recognition using, in Zeki, uh, I'm sorry, in Ramachandran's case especially, uh, the exaggerate, exaggeratedly salient forms of caricature. The fact that saliency uh, is something that we respond to, whether we want to or not, we respond to it, um, as in the case, and of course, something that Daumier uh, knows and plays on um, uh, uh, very much. The other thing that interests Ramachandran is the entire world of anamorphic um, uh, perception um, and the way in which orientation selection affects our limbic system. Uh, this is, of course, the famous Holbein uh, and uh, this notion that uh, uh, where uh, one has literally to rotate or switch uh, in order uh, to make a, a concealed image pop out. In other words, uh, one cha and what's interesting uh, 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 about this is that as one rotates or changes, one doesn't just change the object, one changes oneself at the same time. What is significant from both the artistic and the scientific standpoint is how such equivocal imagery, and let me bring in an 18th century example, Goya's Caprichos, uh, which are literally littered with meta pictures. Uh, they contain um, uh, hidden images, uh, which are very difficult to see unless, like um, uh, the Holbein, either you rotate the image, and Goya says they were hand-sized. They were meant uh, to be rotated. They were meant to be pedagogical. They were meant to be quite literally revolutionary. Uh, but Goya realized one doesn't change the world en masse. One changes the world one person at a time. So included the haptic element, you hold it and you rotate it and an other image uh, comes uh, forward. Um, in the mirror also in this, uh, 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 this scene of superstition, uh, here comes the boogeyman, where if you rotate yourself um, an image um, uh, a, um, uh, a rather distorted portrait uh, appears um, on uh, the side of the, uh, of the mantle. It's this kind of imagery uh, that has almost a subliminal effect on our perception uh, that interests um, Ramachandran. And he talks about the moment uh, when one achieves um, what he calls the aha of recognition. Here then, and again, this is my positive, I want to say something very positive about this work before I get to the downside, uh, bringing in uh, Archiboldo. Here then, it seems to me, are the biological activities that undergird both the imaginative leaps of analogy as well as the similarity searching aesthetics of mimesis. In other words, we begin to understand um, at a more profound level in the work, uh, this is the work of the court painter to Rudolf uh, II in Prague, um, uh, these famous paintings that are really bistable images um, uh, by Archimboldo. Uh, this is both a still life painting, but it is also a portrait of a cook, depending again if you rotate yourself or rotate the image. And what interests him, as uh, in similarly as to what interests Zeki, is that this jump to connect is something that is out of our control. It is something that we are um, impelled to do. It is a, something that is uh, hardwired. Now, I've said the positive things. I want to draw attention to two negative aspects or aspects that it seems to me where we could actually make a contribution. Um, I'm going to first make an observation on the scientific side. One of the problems with brain modularity studies is all the recent work on the pharmacological brain. There is the cultural brain, there is the biological brain, but there is also the pharmacological brain, the work of dopamine and serotonin, um, the work of neurotransmitters, which actually leaks from one region to another um, and gets rid of a brain localization phrenological model of the mind. The second thing, I want to say it from the cultural side. Um, um, although uh, their selection of imagery, that is Zeki's and Ramachandran, seems to be very wide ranging, I hope I've shown you that actually it is rather narrow. Uh, it is foregrounding work, only work, uh, that is predicated on involuntary um, uh, reaction, um, lack of conscious control, not on those images uh, that I began my talk with. And we know uh, that uh, from other, and I want to invoke other people, that 
can be brought in and other kinds of art uh, that we should be thinking of, uh, especially given the work uh, on the emotion, um, the emotional brain, which the affective brain, this is a huge area right now. I cite only Antonio Damasio. Um, it is these people um, that, uh, it seems to me, um, uh, people who are working on the amygdala, on the insula, um, uh, to whom um, uh, we need to look um, for um, uh, the, um, uh, these uh, wonderful 18th century figures who actually ground expression in the total, cho uh, total choreography of the body um, and embed the work of vision in the phenomenology of the senses. Of course, uh, Blake um, and uh, I cite as well Heinrich Fusli, wonderful exhibition of Fusli as well, um, uh, that uh, where this new research investigates um, complicated phenomena, uh, the flooding, not the modular, but the flooding effects of fear, joy, um, or emotional neutrality, and the ways in which, um, again, uh, Blake, um, uh, uh, Blake's uh, agonistic, uh, mythopoetic um, uh, features. I mean, these, this is the kind of work uh, that you will not find in Zeki and Ramachandran and Flaxman. I'm just going to go fast because I know I'm running behind. And I want to end on the whole category, which also fascinated uh, the archaeological wing of the 18th century, the apotropaic image, um, the, um, uh, the image uh, that uh, manages to cut through uh, physiology and bind uh, psyche and body uh, in uh, one stroke. I mean, this complex imagery is something that the neurosciences um, uh, and uh, um, we can contribute to them. I want now, um, and I'm entering my my bottom stretch here. I want to return to my master subject, uh, which is attention. And I've tried to put forward, I mean, we all can say, yes, we know how difficult attention is, but I've tried to put forward maybe some other reasons that are not so obvious, uh, that um, uh, selective attention, focused attention, things that concern us in our museums and in our universities, uh, the difficulties of noticing why I, I, I'm proposing that they have become more acute, more acute even um, maybe than we realized. and. I, one reason is, um, uh, as, as I've been proposing, uh, the fact that consciousness apparently produces its own content. That is the world. The ar that is the argument. And, uh, but this contemporary neural Platonism is demonstrating that even our objects of perception, paradoxically, are not located in some external event. I don't have the time to go into this, but there's an extreme branch of, um, of phenomenology that makes Merleau-Ponty look like a piker. I mean, extreme, um, uh, what a Diderot uh, would have called the Neoplatonism of the cave. It's, it's the, it's the uh, Neoplatonism of the fourth and fifth century Neoplatonists um, uh, that is out there as well that says, you know, I mean, it go, uh, that says there is no outside world. It is all this self-generated, um, there is no actor on the stage. There is no ego um, uh, there. Um, in the era of the virtual reality cave, of cocooning, the domestic workplace, homeschooling, political isolationism, and the inner sanctum of the web, um, it is hardly surprising that autopoiesis would have become a major ruling model for mental operations. For better or worse, information technology, nobody knows better than Ken Knospel, IT, or the paradigm of efficient, largely imperceptible, but above all automated information transfer is invisibly threaded through the metaphors of brain self-organization. This simultaneously hyper-personal impersonality of thought is captured um, in research into neuron-to-neuron -neuron communication and oscillatory switching, demonstrating how the brain is able to organize itself functionally and architectonically during development. While a brain-wide distributed network orchestrates the perception and memory of facts, there is no I orchestrating it, this system-wide functional feature also creates configurational associations between the experiencing subject and external stimuli. 
This codependence derives in part from evidence that sensory cues get selectively represented in multiple cortical areas according to their varying impact, again, on pre-existing brain functions. Since neurons must be capable of rapid, predictive reorganization of focus depending on myriad cues incoming from the environment, we are indeed creatures composed of many independent consciousnesses. The vexing question of cognitive binding specifically asks just how do these oscillating network-wide voltages get coordinated into a coherent whole? The fact of their mysterious collaboration in the internalization of the phenomenal world, reach, reaching together beyond the body's surface <coughs> while embedded inside a closed internal functional space remains the central riddle. The symbolic shareability of material thought in motion is again predicated on auto-organization. The monist idea that something is capable of producing a certain type of behavior by itself. Such autonomy stemming from two different traditions, cybernetics and thermodynamics, proposes that material entities are auto-constitutive, generating themselves as a continuous process the problem with these origins in circuits and non-living systems as opposed to living organisms and evolving processes, however, is that they can lead to reductionism, and, and that is what I was suggesting. My larger point throughout has been that the growing evidence for sensory input independence supported by the importance of automatic processes and cognitive activity places special pressure on what I have been calling the remaining empirical 10%, what we all, museum curators, museum directors, college and university teachers. That's all we have left to work with. One could argue that Vico, one could argue that Vico already in the new science proposed that the human mind gives shape to the world and the world, in turn, is in the shape of the human mind. And I remind you of the 18th century and actually romantic um, uh, construction of mythopoetic systems, uh, such as these that attempt actually to coordinate. Um, co what, what's interesting is the 18th, and the, uh, the 18th century and I would say the early 19th century struggle uh, to coordinate uh, both that self-reflexive uh, aspect of the psyche with the environment in all these systems that uh, attempt to coordinate color with cosmos, uh, uh, biology and geology with culture, um, and uh, even um, uh, uh, impression or imprint um, with cultural glyph. These are all struggles um, to make palpable and manifest uh, the effort of coordination. And let me say that more clearly. It seems to me that Vico's mythopoetic system, uh, which focused on the historical origins of public, not private, communication, offers a telling contrast to today's solipsistic neural structuralism, obsessed by everything from autism to sensory deprivation. If the brain mind as the Romantics thought, has once again become a shadowy cavern, we may well ask, what do we actually see? Surely not, as Plato would have it, flickering copies of outside appearances projected on the unifying screen of the mind. If it is, as the wonderful French neurobiologist Jean-Pierre Changeux uh, suggests, a global workspace, generating schemata that organize the world into corresponding categories, how much do we actually depend upon vision in our symbolization of the world? I mean, that is a question uh, as a lifelong devotee and, and a proponent of the visual, it is a question I ask myself. If in its continuous incorporation of external objects, our body's nervous system is neurosymbolic, just as the ongoing electrochemical activity wiring together different self-maps is neurophenomenological, is visual literacy, for example, an adequate concept 
to this emerging view of the cosmos in the brain. I find it ironic that while art historians have almost exclusively for, what, three decades, almost four decades, been excavating the social side of art history, and we were not the only ones, the role of vision in the construction of experience has been whittled away. <sighs> Museums certainly need to think about this. Although the object of perception can begin either at the sense receptors or in the imaginal cortex, we now know that the brain routinely goes beyond what is visible in sensory information to construct a complexly emotional and recollection-laden mental representation. In addition, it is not at all unusual to have visual experiences when we are not actually seeing anything. Um, there is an enormous amount of work in prehistory right now um, in cave art, uh, again, uh, especially because of the discovery of Kozger, the new cave paintings um, uh, near Marseille. Um, this is from Altamira, uh, but it's interesting how this, uh, again, how this kind of imagery is explored as entoptic imagery, that is imagery that occurs in the retina whether you want it to happen or not, imagery um, that, in point of fact, we all share. Evolutionary biologists such as Nicholas Humphrey argue that bo the bodily behavior of today developed from sensory responses in the past. It's sort of the cavism of the romantics back again. Over long stretches of geological time, our sensations became recursive, looping back upon themselves to become in the process self-creating and self-sustaining. Such sensory activity still calls attention to the present moment in extending itself towards the actual sites of stimulation to ev evaluate them. But it also remains closer to home, locked inside the private dynamics of the nervous system. Uh, that is our own moist physiological cave. Ironically, despite, and I'm, this is my conclusion, Despite the explosion of sensory media, everywhere you look, there it is, e-media, everywhere. Despite the explosion of sensory media, professionals in the ways of the visual, museum curators, pedagogues, college teachers, all of us, despite that explosion, we are faced with a shrinking arena of influence. We used to think we knew why it was a shrinking arena of influence. I want to now say there is a different reason as well. In this talk, I've tried to sketch both an opportunity and a challenge. If the spectrum of consciousness, and with it mental representation, is a product of the nervous system, then studies of how we have developed a set of socially shared mental images becomes even more vital, Vico's public communication. If so much scientific, and they are not the only ones, even humanistic research has gone and continues to go into the exploration of how we organize our individual inner universe. What are the inducements for moving outward to, shame, to shape public forms of communication in which visual images comprise the prime component? In fact, if the human brain models the world for each individual, why confront experience at all to test one's perceptions? Jean-Pierre Jean Changeux actually writes an entire book where he tries to answer that question, but he, he does not have an answer. He suggests that the widespread accessibility of information within neural networks permits the evaluation, Kant's judgment, the evaluation of hypotheses in relation to other information. In other words, you can get out of uh, the solipsistic cave. Yet he leaves, importantly, he leaves unanswered the question of what induces you to go outside in the first place. Why go outside in the first place? As in Keatsian negative capability, why not just linger among too many possibilities or too many constrained alternatives? Certainly the findings of neurobiology have fundamentally altered the meaning of perception, memory, emotion, image, so that we can no longer continue with outdated definitions. Personally, 
I believe we must fold visual studies into a more general phenomenology of the senses, focused on understanding how neural plasticity holistically informs any situation. This situationism would take into account how pre-attentive seeing, like the varieties of memory, the secondary consciousness, and other automatic physiological processes or bodily functions taken together, and this is the missing piece, become amplified by selective attention. In other words, I want to rise up. It's not enough just to focus on involuntary mechanisms. To how they become amplified by selective attention and conscious conceptualization. In contrast uh, to what our beloved or many of our beloved romantics uh, argued, I actually believe creativity may well lie in escaping, not giving in to our autopoetic machinery and focusing carefully on the world. Such against the grain, outward directed attentiveness is made even more difficult today, and again, I evoke, invoke Georgia Tech, by the proliferation of, auto, um, of autopoetic devices and mobile media, that is, media that is tailored to, in, speaking of brain modularity, to individual neural functions. Um, I remind you uh, how many technologies are being made right now uh, that are intrinsically compatible with our brains endlessly self-configuring and inward zooming remote control. These range from solipsistic headphones to environment screen Bose headsets, filtering, filtering technologies, that's going to get rid of attention totally, uh, to micro-sized PDAs and removable M3 players to immersive console-based gaming systems. But that is not enough. We are in Atlanta. I want to say there is also the phenomenon of tailored medicine, the pharmacopoeia of medicines that are tailored uh, to induce highs, lows, you name it, and also drug intervention uh, methods. And again, uh, I cite the work of contemporary artists. This is Fred Tomaselli, paintings that are made entirely of Valium, for example. Uh, or this you will notice, uh, also another Fred T uh, Tomaselli drug-based uh, paintings, but made uh, with this colorful and seductive uh, pharmacopoeia of um, alluring pills. Um, and um, yes, let me perhaps end uh, with Damien Hurst. Um, my bottom line then is um, Pache Wittgenstein that seeing not seeing as enables knowledge to grow. Educating the remaining 10% then is about showing the public the deep effects, the worthwhileness of volition and effort. Um, to accomplish this, um, I think we uh, in the, on the side of the humanities, um, need the neurosciences to refine and sharpen the way we think about cognitive processes historically. But the neurosciences also need the humanistic disciplines and the institutions that support those disciplines uh, because they are engaged with images uh, that are made to elicit and educate attention. Uh, they demonstrate that changing our brains can also actually change the world. Thank you. We do ask, though, that you speak into the microphone because the um, lecture is being filmed for educational purposes and for the sake of the entire audience. So if you want to raise, yeah. Thank you. Hi. 
Barbara. So I'm Janet Murray. So I was a Victorianist in another life, but some of my best friends are 18th century people. Uh, and I'm also head of the digital media program at Georgia Tech. So I'm, I have a, a double reaction here. On the one hand, I'm really stirred by your evocation of the role of art and of creativity in making us see anew. And I think that you have reinvented the classic aesthetic arguments for art uh, in, in the light of this, uh, of our new neurobiology. And I'm very grateful for that. And I'm also very stirred by your example. But I'm confused by two parts of your argument. Um, and so one part is, I don't understand, I guess here, the, and to give you the shorthand, I don't understand why we are, it's a crisis, and I don't understand what you have in for digital media. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, so, you know, well, so I want to defend. So, so if you could clarify these two sure. things. So, sure. So I think it may not be a crisis if, because even though we have, we've always had only 10% that was automated, so it's not as if we woke up in 2007 and we're surrounded by computers and therefore we only have 10% or that's what's keeping our students from listening to us. We've always only had 10% and if that 10% is in control of all this other automated equipment and then that is a power. It's as if you're saying the steering wheel is only part of the car and therefore we're somehow disempowered by having to steer. So I don't, I don't get that part. And then let me just finish and then I'll sit down. And then the other part is that I feel that though I share your sense of this solipsism that one can induce with digital media. A medium is a medium. One, you know, as Don Quixote was all about how you can induce solipsism with other immersive media. So I don't, but what we have at our disposal is the new means to control all of these cultural patterns as never before. So why is that not just like the invention of, of painting or the invention of, of, of language or of written language a, as something that empowers attention rather than diminishes attention? But thank you for letting me clarify. I, by no, I mean, I am, as I, I know you know, rather passionately interested in, in, in uh, digital technologies, but they're technologies and technologies. What the technologies I'm actually interested in uh, are sensor-based technologies, which actually make you aware, makes the user aware. I, this was not within the realm of this talk. I'm well aware that there are different kinds of technologies. I think what I would say to you, however, and I, I think you would have to agree with me, not at Georgia Tech, not at uh, a, a school that is um, so inflected by um, intellectual issues, but I think that the general market, what is out in the market, is a model of technology that is very much like VR simulation, that is somehow simulation, uh, an illusionizing technology. Uh, and I am interested, actually, in maybe more experimental technologies, technologies, by the way, that the net is also making possible. This is not meant to be an indictment of all technologies. I'm saying that there are I'm saying two things. You say, um, hasn't this been there all the time? What I'm saying is that there is a very interesting confluence um, of an enormous amount of interest. If you do an up periscope and you look across the field, and I don't mean intellectual field, I mean I just look across, um, it is striking how much research effort, I read science, I read nature, how much research effort is on auto-organization. I mean, that is stunning. And proportionally, how little research is actually on attention. Given that, to me, that is a new phenomenon. That is certainly not what happened in experimental, I, if we think of the era of J.J. Gibson, for example, if we want to think of earlier, 
um, uh, uh, work in psychology, if we think of the work of Moholy Naj, uh, if we think of Georgie Kepish at MIT, these people were interested um, in um, an extremely complex model. Um, so I'm, th that's what I'm trying to bring forward. And I'm saying as well um, that there are also being developed commercially technologies that speak to that. Malcolm Gladwell's technologies of Blink, for example. That's not what you're designing, uh, but it's out there. Uh, screening filtering technologies. All of these, uh, those are the ones. What I'm saying is that there is a coming together. Uh, it's an interesting and I think a rather different moment, and it's a moment that permits us to make an intervention and point out, especially in our various institutions, um, that maybe some greater effort has to be to get the pre-attentive seeing together with attentive seeing, that those things have to be brought together. And for that, you need the cultural side, and you need, which is why I spent some time on Zeki and Ramachandran, you need a broader spate of images. You can't just show images that are illusionizing, uh, that simply speak to those systems. Of course they do. That's not denying it, but they do more than that, and there are other sorts of formats. So basta, I won't say more, but it seems to me it gets to the two points you're raising. Okay. Are there other questions? Okay. Yes. Barbara, I certainly agree that attention is a scarce commodity, always has been and maybe in the economy of information seems even scarcer as we're uh, drinking from the dirty fire hose of information on the web. Um, I'm fascinated by the way students uh, are self-medicating about this in a certain sense. And the, the instance for us as classroom teachers is the death of the lecture. Uh, many of us learned much of what we learned as undergraduates from dramatic, rhetorical, performative, inspired Lecturers, and I, I think part of what we did in learning from them was to to want to be like them, uh, and to make the imaginative leap of what it might feel like to organize knowledge in that way, to talk with that degree of persuasiveness, and so forth. I notice that nowadays students don't like lectures. You can put the best people you have out there to give lectures, and the students will opt for a course. Uh, in, in a smaller section in which the dedicated graduate student doing the teaching knows their name and lets them talk. So I wonder if it's not the case that um, in, in a certain sense, in eschewing a, a format that many of us loved and, and perfected, that our students are telling them that in order to have that experience of volition of which you spoke so movingly at the end, they need to be participants. Well, that's, I, you know, that's a really, uh, I, I think that's a very profound observation because, I mean, it's also the success of blogging. I mean, one can think of, you know, a lot of um, uh, maybe more intimate forms on, in some ways, more intimate, more personal forms on the web. It's, uh, but that still leaves open the problem of narcissism and public communication. I'm going to leave that aside and, and try to address uh, maybe the conversational, let's take an 18th century uh, example, the conversationality of what you're suggesting is successful as opposed to the person like myself standing up here uh, lecturing. Um, and yes, um, in other words, but what that, I, I think that's a wonderful example and it, I, I would say the art uh, side of that, I, I would illustrate that uh, by work that um, uh, puts pressure, dialogical pressure on an audience. In other words, work uh, that makes you aware that you are actually engaging in a to and fro rather than, let's say, something like the Magritte I showed you, where you see something whether you want to or not. In other words, do, do, do you see where I'm going with this? So that uh, there is, I would say, um, an art equivalent 
of, um, uh, of what you're suggesting. And I, I'm, I'm suggesting that richer formats, uh, that we need to work with our scientific colleagues and we too need to learn from them um, uh, and need to put other, and I'm not excluding literature from that in, in any way. Actually, one could think of performative um, uh, types of literature as well, which put a special kind of pressure uh, on, uh, on the beholder. Actually, um, in the book, um, uh, that uh, Ken mentioned, the Echo Objects book, I, I have uh, a whole chapter on tight formats, um, uh, compressive data formats, um, everything from the emblem uh, uh, to uh, 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 Twittering, I suppose, where um, you, uh, those formats historically, one can think of Ezra Pound, you know, uh, poetry's fretwork, uh, where it puts a pressure um, on um, the person that you are addressing to make a contribution. In other words, it's not passive, it's attentive. And so I, I, I think we're on the same page with that. I appreciate your, uh, your example. Yes. <laughs> so I guess what you're highlighting in a way is the importance of good design and how important that is for both the museum and for pedagogy. And I wondered if you could go back to one of your earlier slides, I think near the very beginning, where you talked about uh, spaces of contemplation and the importance of that. Um, I don't know whether I can go back to it. I, you want the, uh, 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 my, the very first slide? Or the Toledo, the p pavilion at Toledo, yes. And and what what I'm sorry. And what would you like me to do? I, uh, what I was suggesting was that it is th that this, I, well, I, I love the, the image of uh, uh, the architect, and I thought uh, that uh, the way in which she creates, and she's quite known for this, for creating spaces, um, well, I'm sorry, we don't have it, but it was the, the pavilion, the glass pavilion of the Toledo Art Museum. But we can go out and actually look at the Rienzo Piano, which I think actually accomplishes some of the same thing, um, of where it stops you um, and forces you to attend. In other words, where the actual institutional structure, um, uh, allow it frames what you are seeing and allows you to attend to it uh, in a way that uh, one would otherwise simply pass it by. It would take me more time to, to sort of demonstrate that, but I think that would be uh, the line of argument I would go. I mean, she um, is known for creating spaces um, that um, uh, really elicit uh, uh, this uh, uh, this way of not going by or not simply responding but simply stopping and uh, uh, it, engaging in a kind of lengthy or prolonged looking and that's that was the point I was trying to make there all right we'll take one more question if someone has one last question I'm sorry I would need it up to do it and, and, and I but yeah no Okay. Thanks very oh, much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. 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 Thank you.